Hi, everyone. This is And Just Like That, The Writer's Room, the official companion podcast from HBO Max and Pineapple Street Studios. They say some things never change. Oh, honey, I'm home. Carrie, party of three. <laughs> but the truth is, life is full of surprises. Oh. And just like that, a new chapter begins. Okay, guys, it's 11 years later, and we're back. <laughs> Carrie, Miranda, and Charlotte aren't the only trio reuniting. I'm Michael Patrick King, writer and director of And Just Like That, and I'm sitting here with two people who worked with me on the new show, as well as the original, iconic Sex and the City series, executive producers and writers, Julie Rottenberg. Hi, I'm Julie. And executive producer and writer, Elisa Zaritsky. Hi, I'm Elisa. Okay. Julie, Elisa, both of you joined Sex and the City as story editors in the year 2000, very glamorous, 2000, and went on to produce and write many episodes with me and for us. But you brought very different perspectives into the room. Julie is someone who has no qualms about giving you an opinion. <laughs> Most memorably at this moment, I don't like Aiden. Day one. I might have said that <laughs> on my first day. And Elisa is someone who, among many of her other traits, knows her way around a good joke. One of the first jokes that she pitched that got in and sealed her fate as a great joke writer was what, Elisa? Oh, my God. She's fashion roadkill. When Carrie fell down on the runway. Dearly <laughs> departed. Yes. Willie, Willie Garson, Garson Stanford yeah. line. So the whole thrust behind this is that we wanted to have a little bit of a conversation from the writing room. We're going to be guiding you through the 10 new episodes of And Just Like That, along with the other members of our beloved writing room, Samantha Irby, Rechna Fruchtbaum, and Kelly Goff, and maybe even some special guests along the way. The fourth writer today is the brilliant comic New York Times bestselling memoir writer, Samantha Irby. She's a comedian, a writer, hugely important part of creating the new stories for this season, who is talking to us from an incredibly chic farmhouse in Kalamazoo, <laughs> Mizzou, Michigan, if chic in Kalamazoo, Michigan, <laughs> can be forced into a sentence. Yes. Hi, everybody. Our house is falling apart. <laughs> Get out yeah. before it does, because we have to finish this podcast. Um... Now, you have to understand, none of us were in the same room. We were in a Zoom room. We still room. haven't met Samantha <laughs> we Irby. We I'm like we a ghost. Can't I, wait I, I think we've met her. We, we just haven't like inter have. been in her physical presence. Yeah. But yes. we were six people meeting virtually for the first time talking about this stuff. And the interesting thing about a Zoom writing room, which is different than a normal writing room, everybody's in extreme close-up. So as the showrunner, I could see when people weren't saying something. And I would fucking zoom in on uh, Samantha and go, Samantha, what? She goes, I fucking hate this storyline. <laughs> that no, only happened was... a few times, but when it did happen, it was something I really hated. The word treacle is a television writing term that means overly sweet. <laughs> and then there's another phrase in television writing called treacle cutter. And treacle cutter is you usually put a joke in to cut, to put vinegar all over that sugar. <laughs> and or Samantha, you just bring Samantha in. <laughs> yeah, Samantha is a really big treacle cutter. Cutter, which is one of the great gifts. She's also got a giant heart, too. Mm -hmm. She's got a big heart, a big emotional life, a big attachment to things. I do. Good and bad. Good and, and bad. And what's great about that is in the writing room, if it tended to go a little sweet, mm -hmm. Samantha would just call <laughs> bullshit on it. Yeah. And I remember my favorite day of all time, <laughs> of all time, in and just like that with Samantha was I was pitching something about Miranda <laughs> being insecure talking to somebody. Oh, I know what it was. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it I was remember this. a moment where Carrie might have to go off by herself and maybe we were exploring that <laughs> Miranda was concerned. She didn't want to when let her she friend back. go off yes. by herself. And Samantha. <laughs> and I, I, a new me, character was born. <laughs> We're going to have to hear it, Sam. I mean, I know that it's kind of played out. Like, everybody's like, oh, I'm a Charlotte. Or, but, like, I, I literally am a Miranda. The thought that my queen, Miranda, would be like, oh. <laughs> 
my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> you took her away from me. Uh, 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 <laughs> was like, like <laughs> hurt me deep uh, in my heart. <laughs> and so I kept doing that imitation of Miranda for like two uh, hours, especially because it made Michael laugh. And there's like no joy in my life, like bigger than making Michael so Patrick true. King laugh. I, well, the thing that was so made me laugh so much, it was like hitting a shark on the face, you know, like to make it stop. <laughs> yeah. She just came at me with, this is what you're putting into the world. Me, 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 me. I'm a grown woman. <laughs> and it became to represent anything that was too precious for yes. us. But we push back. Nobody wins in the room. There's always mm -hmm. a pushback. No, that's but true. That, but that scene did not exist in the show, so that's the <laughs> truth. Samantha so, Wong. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the origin story of the actual moment of me calling you each and saying, I want to do mm. this again. I mean, because yes. the first thing I've heard from the beginning and the very minimal press that I've done about this is, why would you risk it? Why mm. would you destroy the series uh, of history? Wow. Mm. So, you know, the first thing I said is I thought we had a good story. Mm. That's number one. What did you think when I called you first? Julie. Oh, my God. Well, I was scared. I was terrified. The thought of going back to what I'll speak personally for me as a writer and as a fan was a magical time coming on this show. It was the first TV job Elise and I ever got. And all these years since, we have stayed in very close touch with you, Michael, and we would always talk about, like, ah, oh, if only we had a show, we could do this or we could do that. And Elise and I have since gotten married and had kids and all these stories we wish we could tell, but obviously the show was over. So when you brought up this idea of coming back, we thought we were dreaming. We were like, is he kidding? Is this real? It, it felt insane. How could this be happening? Terror. I was definitely afraid, but mostly I was giddy. I was thrilled. It felt like a a life raft. It was during the pandemic, um, and it felt like a chance to have an outlet for all these stories that we have been experiencing since we closed that chapter right. 20 years ago. I think the power of the show and the reason it's resonated for so many years for so many people is that something about the chemistry of the scripts and the actresses and the direction and everything about it made those ladies more real to people than most television characters are. And they lived kind of on in I can speak for myself in my own head in some way all of these years. So the thought of kind of pulling them out of the box and like putting life back into them and imagining who they would be, where they would be, what their kids would be up to now, it was just the most exciting experiment. It was an experiment. Yeah. And I, I think that the interesting thing is I never – you said put them out of the box. I always imagine that they're still walking around. Yeah. They're in my mind. Yeah. They're walking around. Yeah. And my softest pitch when I went to HBO Max, the easiest, softest pitch about what I wanted the audience to feel was like, they're real. I'm a fan. And it would be like this. Hey, I saw Carrie Bradshaw on the street the other day. And your friend would say, how'd she look? And you go, <laughs> fabulous. Uh. And that's the thing. Like, they're still there. Yeah. And I also want to say that speaking, you know, to the new writers like Samantha Irby for the first time, uh, meeting meeting all of them on the Zoom, it was as if we were talking about our mutual friends yeah. for the first time. That's and so it, true. it was like a super highway to intimacy with each other and ease about plot and care, it, like it all just started immediately when we we had met the shared on experience, the Zoom. which was the show, and mm -hmm. we did a big, wide search for these new writers because we knew we were bringing in new characters. We wanted those characters to be reflected in the writing room, but we also needed geniuses. And so Samantha is a comic writer mm -hmm. of books. She's 
Carrie Bradshaw. Part of her is Carrie Bradshaw, even oh though she God. says she's part of her is Carrie Bradshaw, That's even so though she's nice. Miranda. <laughs> world. But you are. You know publishing world. But what's most interesting about you for the show is your feelings about what it was. Oh. I, before you joined. I mean, when it first aired, uh, I didn't have cable, so I had to wait until uh, all the episodes came out on VHS. So <laughs> I went to Best it's Buy. Amazing. I got my little box set, and my friend Jenny and I, like, drank champagne, uh, even oh. though I was underage, uh, drank champagne and <laughs> watched every episode. Like, we just stayed up all night, and I was like, it was unlike anything I had ever seen. And I don't have any friends like Carrie Bradshaw, you know what I mean? Like, all my friends are, like, fucking idiot pigs who are, like, funny and great um, and nice, and I love them in case they're listening, but they aren't, like, <laughs> fancy people in, like, little cute shoes. So I definitely, I couldn't relate to, like, the fabulousness of it all. I didn't know what a cosmopolitan was, but I was so captivated, like, immediately deep in the world, cared so much about them. And, like, my love for them, like, only grew over the course of the season. Mm. I was really nervous coming into the writer's room. Um, and you guys maybe don't understand, or maybe you do, but um, the show meant so much to me, and the three of you were so iconic to me. Michael, I still am, like, a little scared of you and intimidated <laughs> by you. Oh, like, I, I wish you could there's see a little part face. of me that's like, oh, I don't want to meet them because, like, you're a little, like, you're so intimidating and you made this thing that meant so much to not only me but all of these people. But I didn't know what the writer's room was going to be like, but... You're so open and easy to be around and so receptive. So, like, working on this is, like, a dream. And I know that feels, like, sort of cliche to say, but it's true. Treacly, maybe? <laughs> Samantha <laughs> Irby? Samantha uh, Irby? Uh, I just wish like you had lived treacly. up to your promise. <laughs> See, that would the be the treacle, treacle cutter. cutter. Yes. There I, you I, go. I pissed all over right, it. Right, right. Um, I appreciate uh, so, it. And now it's perfect. Sure, you, I know you enjoy that more than anything. <laughs> yes, One of the things oh, that was so great about bringing in three new people and three people that had been here before was that we could literally say, what did you respond to? What are you done with? Mm -hmm. What should we keep? You know, there's all this talk about, oh, you're bringing in diverse characters. The whole show's got to change. You've got to bring in a new point of view and stuff. And one of the interesting things about the beginning of our conversations about And Just Like That is what must you have? What is mm -hmm. of another time that we should leave behind? What bugged you? What didn't bug you? I remember one of the first things Samantha said is, oh, we were talking oh. about privilege and money and mm -hmm. products and apartments and and things and one of the things Samantha said that I remember that I felt like a power packet yeah. of re, of approval was I loved any time they had a fancy product yeah. I didn't <laughs> know what <laughs> well, if they had a water or a cream but I didn't this, care. I just wanted to see it. I very often, and I'm sure, Elisa, you share this, have this fear of, like, this, the decadent privilege and the wealth, and is it going to be too... Opulent. And, and put, yeah. is that going to pee people off? And Samantha was like, I love that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Like, Otherwise, what are we watching this show for? I could look out my window and see regular people. You know what I mean? Uh, like, I want to see some fancy people in fancy yeah. clothes, like getting with out of regular fancy emotions. Cars. With regular problems. Yeah, with yeah. fancy with regular, lotions. Yeah. I don't want to see, I could like <laughs> talk to my neighbor if I want to hear about some regular bitch who had a bad day. Like, I want to see a fancy broad have a bad You got day. your wish. Uh, I mean. I, I definitely uh, lost on that one. Okay, so let's, so let's start with episode one named Hello, It's Me. And it's worth saying that at this point, if you haven't seen the episode, don't listen. And furthermore, why are you listening to this? This is a site-specific <laughs> podcast. Don't randomly just date podcasts. Know who you're getting involved with. Okay, moving on. Samantha, for a forgetful listener at home, you know, one of those people that just saw something five minutes ago and <laughs> forgot, like everyone in the world because there's so much television, can you tell them really what 
is the thumbnail sketch of what happens in this elaborately conceived first episode. Beautiful ladies eating lunch, um, <laughs> semen from a young man, and big dyes. Wow. So if you didn't leave Concise. and you haven't seen the episode, don't you feel bad now. That's what you, <laughs> that's what you get. Um, let's talk about the big elephant in the room, which is losing a friend, which mm. is Samantha. I'm so glad mm, you said that. Because we got a new friend in Samantha, Samantha Irby, mm-hmm. but we lost another friend, Samantha. Now, let's just say it, and just like that, was never, ever designed to be the four of them. I knew very early that Kim Cattrall no longer wanted to play Samantha. She felt she had, I think, said she was done with it. So the reality was it was not, oh, who are we going to get to fill this in and we got to get a new Samantha. And so what we did decide to explore, which is was a very heated topic in the fan world, mm-hmm. which is like, Where's Samantha? It can't exist without Samantha. Samantha, Samantha, Samantha. And yeah, we didn't want to do the show without Samantha either, so we didn't. We kept her as a character in the show. And we explored the topics of friends. Friends coming and going, losing friends, keeping friends. When you mentioned the idea in your head that uh, the show was born out of as if someone had run into Carrie Bradshaw and someone said, how was she? You reminded me what also happens when you get through your 40s and into your 50s is more and more friends, sometimes friends you were very, very close with, come and go out of your life and how painful that is. And I'm so glad that we didn't that we didn't just say Samantha's in London. Oh, well, that we actually leaned into the fact that it was a rift and that there were hurt feelings and how painful that is. And that we we kept that aspect alive. We did. We kept it alive. And the interesting thing about the structure of the first episode, since I knew that it's like a rabid thought, what did they do with Samantha? I knew that nothing would be listened to until we handled that. So the fourth line in the new series is, where's Samantha? (laughs) And they say she moved to London. And so uh, that's the audience is like, oh, okay, they just did that TV thing where they just got rid of the character when one line, she moved to London. (laughs) And they're like, all right, okay, well, at least she's not dead. (laughs) All right, okay, it's not going to be, okay, it's TV. And then you go on and you enjoy Brady semen and the <laughs> aging stuff, which is so exciting in the first episode. And you think it's just and like, oh, they're done. doing this again. And then they're walking down the street and Miranda says, it is like she's dead, Samantha. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, that's where we throw the gauntlet down. That's where we say, this, we're going in here. Mm-hmm. We're going in, in, in on yep. a lot of things. We have no interest in creating off story drama we want to put it or, in the yeah. story in a way uh, thinking about it now the only way we could honor the reality of how close they were Samantha and Carrie and Charlotte and Miranda is to have it be this painful bruise that that Miranda touches when she says to Carrie it is like she's dead that Otherwise, I wouldn't buy it if she were just in another country no, and it would be they never company. thought about her. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's Three's mm-hmm. Company when they right. had problems on the set. <laughs> oh, and and um, Suzanne, Suzanne Summers. Was, yeah. Right, Su- Suzanne Summers. So she asked right, for right, more money right. and they put her in Europe. Right. But and they put her in front of a drop right, right. and they just kept changing. Like now she's in pants out the window, the Eiffel Tower. Samantha the Taj Irby, Mahal. Um, Three's Company right. is a sitcom <laughs> from Belize. <laughs> I'm about to be 42. I know what Oh, my God. I know who Jack Tripper is. A little younger. Yes, you do, because you are a pop culture sponge, (laughs) which is why you're also on the show. You know everything. Um, But the reality is we didn't want to do that. We wanted to explore it as a storyline, which is what we sort of do on the show. Anything that kind of happens to any of us in real life, well, you'll see. Our real lives are in the show. And what happened to us was Kim Cattrall didn't want to come back. So that's our real life. So we put it in the show as Mm -hmm. Samantha. And Mm -hmm. it was, it's it's story. Everything's story for us. Also, I remember in that first scene you wrote with Carrie and Miranda, that became a hot 
a hot topic for mm-hmm. us in the writer's room. Each step you took in writing that scene, it was very heated because I felt I felt we were both protecting. We felt protective of Samantha. Sure. We felt protective of Samantha. And, and we, we felt protective, protective of Carrie. Carrie. Yeah. So it was like we were we were navigating an argument between two close friends. And this, this might be yes. a good time to explain that every script, no matter who it's written by, is walked around the park a lot. Why all six of us? Mm -hmm. Yes. We really all have an opinion of what's in that. And in that first episode, also, we established two new characters. Three, really. Mm -hmm. Lisa Todd Wexley, a black woman, Mm -hmm. and Nia Wallace, Professor Nia Wallace, a black woman. And that my name is on that script as the writer because I wrote it, but it was infused with everything we discussed as a group. Mm-hmm. As to how these characters could be in the world. And uh, just to the point, I mean, it's so specific. The whole riff in the first episode that's so potentially funny or potentially dangerous is Miranda and Naya's hair. Samantha, how how long did we talk about? Like, <laughs> oh my God. What, what is the level of comedy uncomfortability that doesn't go into... Uh, too Cringe. much. Yeah. What's yeah. the right lane to go down if we're going to try to do that story? Okay, so when Miranda goes back to school, it's her first day of class. She's sitting there like perfect little student. Um, Naya comes in with long braids, very glamorous, very gorgeous. She goes to sit in the professor's seat, and Miranda is like, oh, no, 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 you can't sit there. That's where the professor sits. And Naya looks at her like, uh, what? And says, what do you mean? I am the professor. And then Miranda's like, oh, uh, I didn't know because of your hair. Because she saw a picture of Naya with short hair. And then we have, like, my favorite kind of comedy, which is, like, uncomfortable, (laughs) uh, liberal, I'm not racist, but I said something that sounded kind of racist. And that's how they start their friendship. It's a rocky start. (laughs) We talked about it a lot. And I am very, like, just just make the joke. Just make the joke that, like, pushes the envelope. And Kelly, who was in our room, who's black as well, um, is very much not (laughs) like that. Uh, So we would often, within the writer's room have like a breakout NAACP meeting (laughs) that you all got to watch while we went back and forth about what would make Black people mad. I think not much. (laughs) Kelly thought a lot. Um, But it's really, I mean, you know, we started this being like, this is diverse. We're adding these new characters. I think it's like really weird for them to, you know talk about race stuff all the time in a, like, professorial kind of way. I think the way, like, in culture we talk to each other is a little bit more relaxed. So I was ready to make all of the black hair jokes, all of the <laughs> all of the jokes that, that would uh, get us in trouble. But I feel like we landed in a good spot with Naya and Miranda. I did too. I mean, because really what it is, it's about somebody slipping on a banana peel of trying to say the right thing. Mm-hmm. But because of, as Miranda says in episode one, I tried to say the right thing. And, and because of the current climate, I said all the wrong things. <laughs> She's the rebel. Mm-hmm. And we put her in back in college where you can't be the rebel anymore. Mm-hmm. And then that's fun to see her repress what she would have been saying 20 I years also, ago. I also think that she's awkward in a way, and all of them are awkward in a new way. And I think there's an awkwardness about <laughs> our age that we don't, we, I, I've never really seen talked about before. It's almost like a second adolescence or something. Like we're all going through puberty again, just <laughs> trying to figure out how to say and do <laughs> so it, it, with the right intentions, the best way to be and conscious to be conscious and aware and you can fall over yourself doing that and so I I think it's fun to see our ladies kind of 
struggle a little bit yeah. now. Yeah, one of the things about the old series that we had a rule about is no one could get on the soapbox and make a speech without the soapbox breaking. We used to say, <laughs> every time somebody makes a speech about men, men are blah, 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 <laughs> like they've got top a knot in their teeth. There was never a speech that said, I'm better than you. Right. But let's talk about the aging thing, because that was another fun thing to, to not go through, <laughs> pardon me, <laughs> but to explore, which was we had a range of ages in the writing room. Mm -hmm. I'm the oldest, 33. <laughs> We're in our late 20s. Julie and Elise are in their 20s. And Samantha, it's a baby. Yeah, I'm a toddler. Oh, that math um, works. Toddler. I'm in my 60s. Julie and Elise are not in their 60s. Mm -hmm. Samantha's in her 40s. Kelly's in her 40s. And Retchen is somewhere in, also in her 40s. In her 40s. Yeah. Okay. We, we, so the reality 60s. is, yeah. if you're in your 40s, society says you might as well be 100. Yeah. It's true. I mean, it's that's true. where we are. So Everybody says, why was the, the, the first series good? And I think it's because society said, if you're single, mm -hmm. it's awkward. In your 30s, yeah. It's awkward. Everybody feels sorry for mm -hmm. you. Go away. Mm -hmm. So the idea of all the comedy that came from being awkward I mean, remember Jenny Bix did that thing where we went to a party and they were giving out Christmas ornaments and she went to get one and they said only for couples. Yeah. <laughs> what? And I she brought that. that into the writing room and we went dined crazy. on it. The yeah. idea of only for couples. Oh so you're God. it's awkward and you're a leper. Coming back now, what's awkward, as Elisa said, is 50s. Society's like, you're, you're done. kind of awkward. Yeah. Can you go in a caftan and go away? Can, can I tell you that I've been realizing recently how amazing it is that in the very first episode that the ladies actually say, I'm how 55. Old they are. And I realized that, you know, you That's another place we draw we throw the, the, yes, the, the mic right down. away. 55, and I said you, it. I remember, what, do you want a trophy? I mean, all of us grew up. I remember being a little, little kid and asking an older lady how old she was and being told very sternly by one of my parents, you never ask a woman how old she was. And then you right. learn that, must be that you just, thing. you know, you just learn that. So you never do. After a certain age, you don't do that. And so it's radical, actually. To have women just say, you, if you think about it, who, where, when have you ever heard a woman on television, a character say, I'm... Their age. Well, the response we got when people heard we were doing this show was just that. It was like, but aren't they in their 50s by now? And it was like, yeah. So what <laughs> so does that we? mean? <laughs> like, are we? It Supposed was as if, like, just what go on away. Earth, what on earth well, would you, know, you do with them? And also discuss the differences between them. Miranda's version of 55 in that very first restaurant scene and Charlotte's version of 55, mm -hmm. just how they look is completely different. And to talk about it. That to when, talk about when it. When you told us Miranda's going to be gray, we That was another And let's be very clear. Squealed. Cynthia Nixon isn't is gray. She's not gray. She's blonde in life. And we were like, Miranda's gray. And that was a that way. That felt like. Uh, 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 revelatory, and it felt like the greatest secret weapon right. against and the, what everyone is saying. The great thing is that Miranda says to Charlotte, Charlotte says that thing people say all the time, I just think the gray age is you. Right. And Miranda says, no, you think my gray age is you because then you can't be whatever age you're <laughs> pretending to be. <laughs> just to say to someone, I'm pretending, and then she says, I'm not pretending to be anything. I'm 55, yeah. but her hair is dyed. Right. And, mm -hmm. she is, and then they accuse her of passing. Yeah, you're trying to pass. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and then they go around to Carrie and say, she's got dyeing her hair too, but she says it's obvious. So, <laughs> in a good that's, way. That's right. the loophole. <laughs> I mean, that's the loophole for Carrie. But aging is a big deal to have we actually have people come back, and but also to do it with abandon. But I also want to say that, like, the physical age part is a big deal, too. And being able to watch women who are 55 deal with and talk about things that are happening to their 55-year-old bodies is, like, incredible to me. I don't feel like I've seen a whole lot of that on TV. Um, and as a person who, like, feels like my body is, like, actively decaying, it's really nice to see that 
like sort of addressed on television because mm-hmm. it's either like you're like young and hot or you're like Aunt B, right? There's like no in between. And it's it's just nice to see women like dealing with what a 55-year-old body is like. Mm-hmm. And, and, and to not have it be one way. Mm-hmm. In the new characters, it's important to note that we also argued very hard about what representative relationships they would have. So we have LTW, Lisa Todd Wexley, who we call LTW for some unknown reason. (laughs) She's based on a character I knew, a writer, a brilliant writer I knew, who was Vogue International Best Dress List, but also wonderfully warm and funny and human. And then Kelly had a lot to say. We all had a lot to say about the Upper East Side, sort of this idealized woman with three kids, Mm -hmm. documentarian, money, beauty, style, and yet eats greasy french fries in the first episode on purpose. And is really warm, which before we cast Nicole, I mean, we certainly hoped that that actor would encompass all those things, but Nicole Ari Parker is so, she's both fucking gorgeous and and formidable, but she's also incredibly warm and down to earth and and you love her as soon mm-hmm. as you talk. So to we her. wanted that we wanted her to have from the outside a sort of very aspirational, aspirational type yeah. of couple and family and doing it all. Yes, you can have it all. A hot <laughs> husband who's a investment banker played by Chris Jackson, who is George Washington in Hamilton. <laughs> but and then we we wanted um, Naya to have a different type of a married life. We wanted her to be married as well, but to be based on some feelings in the room to not have children and be about more about career. And that's why, on the in the original runways, Miranda's paired off with Naya because they're both career driven. Mm-hmm. Charlotte's paired off with LTW because they're both Park in Avenue. theory mommy driven Mm -hmm. because we also asked where's carrie now what would carrie be doing a podcast (laughs) (laughs) so carrie and big start episode one happy as they've ever been it's an amazing relationship we went out of our way to try to show them as fully evolved as a couple Mm -hmm. she's even learned how to cook salmon (laughs) and we wanted to show them that way for a reason because what we wanted to do to Carrie was to take away her happiness, which is the whole thrust of why I wanted to do another chapter, which is to see Sex in the City's single girl find happiness with the love of her life and then lose it. And what that loss means and what it means to friendships, it's not just about the loss, the death of that relationship. It's about how your friends help bring you back to life. Mm. And that was the path that I wanted the 10 episodes to be about. How um, your friends are there for you when the worst thing happens in life, which is a death. Can I ask Sam, I'm curious, what did you, what was your first reaction when Michael told you that that's what he was going to do on this show? Well, during my interview, um, after Michael said I was wearing an ugly shirt. No, I said you were wearing, I said you were wearing a grade school kid's T-shirt. Yeah, like a Garanimals. A Garanimals. You you heard ugly. You just projected that's, ugly that's onto your the ankle No time. No, I First of all, so- when he told me during that interview, I was like, "Oh, great! That was like my one stipulation. Not that I would have a real stipulation, but uh, that I would need to work on the show because I didn't understand what we would be seeing Big and Carrie doing." even over the course of, like, two episodes, let alone a whole season. So when when he told me that he was going, I was like, great, let's do it. I, I, to me, it is the, the entire center of the whole show. And then we built out from that. And Mm -hmm. it doesn't have anything to do with my feelings about Mr. Big or Chris Noth, who Mm -hmm. I adore. And uh, I'm incredibly grateful that he took one for the team. Because he came back and did this for us. But it gives a real story. 
where there where there would have been artifice. Even though it's a fake death, everybody. I just want to remind everybody, <laughs> it's fake. It's fictional. I was just when gonna people say, come now at I me, feel like an asshole for being so mean about no, it. No, you're ab- it well. Did. No, we actually no. put Samantha's point of view into that. the show in episode two. Somebody says exactly what Samantha said. Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter is, what I love is that it's so real to people that it will be a shock. Mm-hmm. And I know it was the main reason Sarah Jessica wanted to play it because it is daring and goes someplace beyond shoes. Mm -hmm. When people think the show is about shoes, which is the lexicon for like, and I love that people love shoes. It's fun as a writer. Mm -hmm. It's just like Manola Blahnik, Manola Blahnik, Cosmos. It's, 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 it's style. It's great. Nobody wants to see depression. As Sam said, people want to see people depressed in pretty things, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but the reality is it's not about shoes. And if you've seen the show, and I hope you're not listening to this if you haven't, because <laughs> you've got a problem. Talk about fear of missing out. But the, the fact of the matter is, the thing about the shoes are, in his death, those romantic fairy tale Cinderella blue shoes that he put on her feet in the movie blow off her feet. And that says a lot. And I remember the day we shot, we shot, both scenes, we shot her looking through that great shot you got of her looking through her shoes, and she says, hello, lovers. And then we also shot the death. The death in the shower. And I remember you saying, Michael, those two scenes, they're this episode. It's both. It's both extremes. Mm-hmm. It's both. And mm-hmm. that death, when we filmed the death, Samantha wasn't there, but Julian, and Elise and I were, the first take was... Stunning. And by the way, the bathroom was built for that scene. I didn't want him against a shower wall. I wanted him open. I wanted it open. We made the most, we built the most decadent spa bathroom ever so that he could be open and exposed. And we we created a Peloton bike after much discussion with Chris. Chris is like, I'm not dying alone in, in a shower. shower. <laughs> yeah, that was the original Fuck plan. Fuck it. I'm not dying alone in a shower. And I think that what was interesting about our conversation is that dying alone in a shower feels like an old man. Mm. And getting off a Peloton bike and having a heart attack feels like life. But when we filmed it, it was shocking to have to go through it. Of course, the actors went full on. I mean, Big died a lot. Every single time. And Carrie was wet and lifting him up and he mm-hmm. lifting and lifting and lifting and they were spent. The voices were gone. Her voice was gone. But for us watching it, I was terrified because I said to Julian and Lisa, this might be too much for the audience. And the version that you're seeing is the first version, mm-hmm. which was the most controlled and a little Mm. bit the most poetic Mm. and i hope people aren't too mad that we took away and it's not about carrie and big's happy ending we took away their happy Mm. ending and that's Mm -hmm. the thing i'm worried about with the fans see you i remember you you were like this is not how i imagined it and i was like wow did you imagine i mean we were all standing there it was so upsetting to watch again and again every single time and you said, I think it was just faster. And that struggle that they go through is so, um, it's very painful. And that's what the joy of the difference between life and art is, that we could decide how painful it is and pull back. And how about originally she wasn't even going to be there? Originally, way back in the day. Mm. Way, way, way back. No, he, no, she was going to be there, but he wasn't going to be alive. Right. right. That's right. Originally, Sorry. she was going to come home and find him dead. dead. And Chris said to me, and I understood it. I snapped. She was going to come home and find him dead. And I understood it in a second when Chris said it. He said, we need the last moment. It's silent, but we need to see each other. Mm. And I have to give her permission to go. Mm. And I was like, that's amazing. Because then she gets to actually have a last moment with him. Mm -hmm. Because then we don't allow that for the rest of the next nine Mm -hmm. episodes. She never has Mm -hmm. another moment with him. So why shouldn't she have that big moment? Right. 
Now what? Now what? Mm -hmm. Now what? Which is so many people's lives. The design of the first episode is calculated by us in the writing room to say, here they are. The very first scene looks exactly like with talking about Brady Seaman and Ruth Bader Ginsburg dyed her hair. It's very sex in the city. Bang, 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 back and forth, jokes, fast, fun. And then it transitions in that second scene in the restaurant where they're started talking about podcasts and the future. And, it, and, and it's designed to give you everything you want. And I believe if we had done that first scene every episode again, the audience would reject it. Even though they want it, they, they don't, don't want, want it. it. They don't want it now. They want. They enjoy watching a time capsule, but they don't want to watch a time capsule now. What makes this different than a time capsule? They're, look, they have new circles of friends. They're not each other's only friends. <laughs> they have friends who don't look like them. I mean, the fact that Lisa Todd Wexley sits down with Charlotte and Carrie and Miranda go off. That made me we were so, so happy because do that. we all have different friends. Even Julie and I, who are writer, <laughs> writing partners who spend, you know, 95% of our time together, we still have friends but it, who... But that's a significant moment for us because what we were trying to subliminally say is Carrie and Miranda have gone and LTW sits down at the table. She deserves a seat at the table. And she didn't sit there when there were three because we didn't want to say she's, she's the, the fourth. She's Samantha, right. right. We didn't. Right. She sits down after they leave. And it's important. And there's another weird thing that I love from that we came up with in the writing room is that suddenly you're seeing a black man who's a musician who you don't know. On and you're street, like, why? what's happening? <laughs> what am I watching? And then you say, I don't know who this is. And then you see, oh, this is Naya's husband. And then you meet, oh, oh, we're going to, oh, she's more than a teacher. We're going to follow her. And then you think, well, I don't know what this has to do with the show. And then she comes down on the subway and Miranda's the background. <laughs> she's Miranda's the annoying Miranda's the student. supporting <laughs> character. So we did that a crossfade. And Miranda's inconsequential to this yeah, woman's life. It's like their secondary characters in other people's lives, which is that was so much fun. It's radical and funny. Yeah. And I remember when it first came in, people were like, what's this? Why are we watching him? I said, because you have to. <laughs> you have to learn new people. We have Che Diaz, who is played by Sada Ramirez, and greatly, we had big conversations mm -hmm. in the room about who this character was going to be. What is, haven't we seen? Like, especially once we knew it was Sada, I was like, oh man, Che's <laughs> so hot. This is like, like Che's my Mr. Big. Um, mm. <laughs> I mean, the thing about the new characters that was so exciting to me is like building these people from the ground up. Like it was really great to have Carrie and Charlotte and Miranda and we know them and, you know, we can like instantly jump into their heads, but it was really amazing to like mold these new people. And Che was especially exciting to me because they are so many things that we haven't seen before. Like, all of the women are funny, but Che's professionally funny. And Che's, like, so charming and so sparkling. And I was really, really excited, like, when you came up with the Che character and as we sort of built the layers of what makes them them, that was super, super exciting to me. I mean, especially since Che... Um, aligns most closely with <laughs> who I am. Like, we all project ourselves onto these characters, so I was super excited. But to even have, like, a small hand in what is happening in the lives of these characters that are so beloved to me was incredible. It wasn't a small hand. Yeah. You'll be happy to know there have been a number of times, whether we're on set or watching a cut or listening to music, that Michael will say, Samantha will hate that. <laughs> Okay, so number two, episode 102, which is called Little Black Dress, which is, of course, you know, in New York, everybody has to have a little black dress for cocktail parties. And the tragedy of this episode, it's a little black dress for a funeral. So here we have Carrie Bradshaw, who is 
left at the end of one, an emotional mess with her face hidden so you don't even know what mm -hmm. she looks like, how do you move on? And the first thing we thought of was Miranda. And the fact that you didn't jump three days, <laughs> even even week, one day. Like, yeah, yeah, even one even, day. Like, it's two hours. Yeah. That's by the time Miranda the comes from Brooklyn. And, you know, there is no music that connects these two episodes. There's just the out music. There's no music on the front. And this is the director talking now. It goes from Big dying in the water in a shower mm -hmm. to Brady and Louisa fucking okay. with a turtle swimming in a tank behind them. <laughs> it's, oh it's death and peculiar youth at the same yes. time. And then it goes into Carrie and Miranda. And the, the idea, and this is... This is significant, so significant to me that I could almost start crying. The idea of friends helping you through a death, being there when there's nothing to say, is the truest feeling of friendship. To me, the one of the most beautiful moments in Sex and the City was written by Julie and Elisa, which is when Miranda's mother dies and Carrie steps out of the pew and walks down the aisle with her because she has no one. So to have Miranda show up mm. and be the first person and the only person who can comfort Carrie impossibly to comfort by saying nothing but just holding her is amazing. And the other shocking thing that we do is Carrie closes her eyes and you see a flashback from the second season of Big, just for a brief moment. And that was really fun that to play with. That was shocking. With. I want to know, that was 100% your impulse. How did you find that? I wanted to reference somehow what it meant. And I knew, I was there since the beginning, and I knew one of the significant moments in that show was when he left her in that bar and looked over his shoulder and she was left alone. And somehow it just came to me. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was it. So what I love about the second episode really is the coming together of the friends. I also love the restraint of it. I love the fact that Carrie in the writing says very little. One of the interesting journeys of the series is that she feels very little. She doesn't feel bad for herself. Mm. She doesn't allow herself to go to victim. I was reading something somebody wrote, a great novelist wrote, and they said the, the one thing that people will not respond to is somebody who feels sorry for themselves. And I was like, yeah, she can't feel sorry for herself. She has to make it the best day possible. So that's why she's more of a producer of the, of the yeah. memorial service it's than true. actually the star of it. Mm -hmm. She's getting people drinks. She's selfless, probably in shock. Mm -hmm. I just want to say one more thing. And what was important about the death when we were in the writing room and discussed it, we knew that we had to have find ways to still make the show light because both one ends with a shocking thing and two ends with such extreme loneliness mm -hmm. that we went into overgear. Even in the funeral, there's funny stuff. We had no intention of leaving you in a dark forest Depressed, without a light. Yeah. We wanted you to come out and have some fun. And it starts picking up in three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. The darkness is still there, but just like in life, you go on. And you've always said, you said once, Michael, I've never had a day that was all dark without some laughter. And I've never had a day with all laughter and not some dark. Yeah. And that's what that episode needed to do. And so our gamble in the writing room was we loved these characters. We believe that they're true and real. And would you go with us as viewers on this journey with these people that you grew up with, one of whom is had a, suffered a significant loss and others who are going through other big changes in their lives as well. And that was our great challenge to bring you along and hopefully have you engaged. Or not. We're about to find know. out. We, we, we are about to <laughs> look, find out. And look, as creative beings, episode. as writers, everybody knows this. The only thing you can do is, luckily, we're so driven to say something that it bl beta blocks out the fears. Mm -hmm. And now that we've said it, here come the fears. Yes. But it didn't stop us from going as bold and as big mm -hmm. and as silly and as dark. Yeah as we wanted to. It's life and death. We put it in the show.
And just like that, this is the end of our first episode. Thanks, Elisa, Julie, and Samantha. We'll be back next week to unpack episode three called When in Rome. Talk to you then. This is the official companion podcast for the HBO Max show, And Just Like That. And it's a production of HBO Max and Pineapple Street Studios. Our executive producers are Barry Finkel, Gabrielle Lewis, Max Zielinski, and Jenna Weiss-Berman. Our senior producer on the show is Emmanuel Hapsis. Jonathan Shiflett is our producer, and Janelle Anderson is our associate producer. Our managing producer is Aaron Kelly. Josh Gwynn is our editor, and our engineers are Davey Sumner and Elliot Adler. Production music is courtesy of HBO Max. You can listen to the next episode of And Just Like That, the Writer's Room podcast, after watching episode three of And Just Like That on HBO Max. And don't forget to subscribe for new conversations every week, wherever you get your podcasts.